Gracious God, I thank you for the opportunity and the privilege to share a word this morning. I pray for the preaching spirit today. We had such a good time and it was a long day yesterday that I'm not feeling quite spiritual. And so I need you to fill me and refresh me and energize me and help me to be bold. That was the word that we got from yesterday that we as a church want to be bold. And so I welcome you Holy Spirit in the sacredness of this moment to have your way in Jesus' name. Be humble. Be humble is something I heard often from my mother, a woman of the South, who cherishes her Southern ways, truly, and who overcame many obstacles in her life to become a strong businesswoman, a devoted mother, and a prayer warrior. She's one of my heroes, or I would say Shiro, this day. And I noticed over the last few years, as my own daughter started achieving some significant milestones in her life, my mom would always tell her upon departure, be humble. Now my family and close friends, they know my mom well, she is mother to many. And they know that she has a particular way of saying words, slowly, carefully, and intently. To be honest, we actually act out how she does it. <laughs> Uh, we all have a joke when, when one of us will say something, we'll say, oh, you sound like mother. You are speaking clearly and intently. So when she says humble, she doesn't pronounce the H. She says, I want you to be humble. And we all roll our eyes and smile. Now, I didn't realize it or admit it to myself until recently that I've struggled with that word. I've struggled with it as a woman in society, a woman in leadership. I've struggled with it as a woman rich in melanin in spaces where I have often not been welcomed. I struggled with the notion of humility or being humble, which is having or showing a modest or low estimate of one's importance. I don't know about you, but that doesn't seem easy. And for someone like me, I've recognized that it takes confidence, it takes strength, it takes resilience, and a can-do attitude to achieve anything in life. It requires overcoming fear and doing what Joyce Meyer entitled a book I read over and over again, Do It Afraid. Do It Afraid. 
how can one be both humble and a risk taker and a fighter and a change maker? It means one learns the dance of life. What do I mean? It means paying particular attention to how one moves through life and presents oneself to the world. How one balances going after one's goals with vigor and achieving a modicum of success. While being mindful of how those less fortunate, less successful, are being treated or whether they have opportunities before them. How one maintains a sense of self while being in tune with others and with God. It's hard to do all of that and maintain humility. At our leaders retreat yesterday, we spent the afternoon going through exercises, coming up with words and phrases that describe us, that describe FCC. And we did that so we could gain some clarity for ourselves before we share our story with the world. We needed to begin the process of knowing exactly who are we. We need to have an understanding of where we've been. We needed to talk about who do we want to become. It's nice to show up each week or tune in each week or, you know, we have some people who worship and connect with us from afar. They're not really here. They're back and forth and that's okay. Whatever you need to do for your life. But how then do we craft a message for people who don't have a church home, for people who are observing us? It starts with us. Where have we been? Who do we want to become? What do we want to share with those outside of these walls way, way before they ever come to our doors? They already have an opinion. What do we want to share with them before they come or before they tune in to us virtually or look at our website? Friends, yesterday's retreat was eye-opening. And right there, I want to thank Kathy, who's here today, because she organized it, and it was beautiful, and we thank you. It was eye-opening because we were told by the person that led us in the discussion that's working with us, he said, our current messaging is not really for others, it's for us. And we all had a big aha moment. He's like, what you're saying is nice, it looks nice. We have our E! News, we have our Facebook, we have our Instagram. He said, but that's not really speaking to anyone else. It really is speaking to you, those that are already here. We're gonna have this on Saturday, we're gonna do this next week, we did that last week. But what is that saying really about us? to those outside. And in that moment, in that time, it explained why we had difficulty coming up with a logo last year. We tried. We had meetings, we had someone come in, we looked at some things, but we learned something yesterday. We learned that it takes time. And we thought we could do it quickly. We learned it takes time. We learned that it takes conversations 
with multiple people in different age groups, different backgrounds, different lengths of time at this church. We just can't come up with that. We learned that it takes stories. We started the, the retreat sharing our stories. Why did you come here? What's your life? Where have you been? And we made lists of all the things that are important to people. And it was like, oh my God, every one of you comes with something different, a different background and a different expectation. It takes being honest. And again, input from a variety of people. In other words, friends, it's a process. It's a process. And needless to say, that discussion changed how I viewed this text this morning. I didn't really like that, but it changed it. Because I looked at this text through a different lens once I got home. And what I had already written, I had to throw out. But that's what a good process should do right? That's what good conversation should do. That's what good prayer should do. It should make us rethink what we're doing and why we're doing it. So what is this parable saying to us today? It was what I did last night. I missed out on a dinner opportunity too because I had to go home and think, what? What is this parable saying to us today? Because we know that scripture speaks to us wherever we are, because we see it through the lens of our current situation and circumstances. This passage that Ashley read, this passage is highlighting the struggle and the reality we each face and our daily lives. You may not see yourself in there, but scripture has us all in there. Just remove the name of the person in there or their title and put yourself in there. The struggle with which we engage and the dance we do between doing the right thing or not. The dance or the movement toward or away from Christ or others. And I use the word dance because if anybody dances or likes to dance or, you know, has just a little bit of rhythm, you know that there's a, a swaying and a movement and a rhythm of moving this way and moving that way. And when you have a partner, you're moving together and your arms are moving and your body is moving to the beat. There's a dance between, good, this is getting good to me. The dance, the dance, I love music, but the dance between faith and fear. There's a dance. The dance between God's ways and our ways. There's a dance. You move closer to what God is calling you to do, and then you sway back to what you want to do, what I want to do. There's a dance between seeking success and, and doing what the world calls us to do and what the world sees as success and the sacred. When I left my job, to go to seminary, people thought I had lost my mind. I had made it to an executive level in higher education with a nice corner office, nice window. We used to laugh because the person who had the office before me had put suede wallpaper on it. I had made it to the third floor. That was what we called it, the third floor. The president's office was way down the hall, but I was on the third floor. Everybody talked about the third floor. You go into a meeting, it's on the third floor. <laughs> such and such and such, they were on the third floor. 
And as soon as I got to that place, here comes the Lord, leave it. I'm like, what? Leave it. And everyone was like, what happened to you? Did you, what, what, what are you doing? Are you gonna become one of those Jesus freaks? You have what some aspire to. You've made it to this place and you're gonna leave to become a minister? It was a dance, a dance between worldly success and the sacred. And I gotta tell you, I wouldn't do anything else in the world but what I'm doing right now. So in that story, the, the Pharisee, which is, uh, was one from the religious order, right? The Pharisee, the religious one, represents the church. And the tax collector basically represents one outside of the church or seeking. So the Pharisee and the tax collector, again, they show us the dance, the dance between the church and the world. But they also show us how both can come together. Many people outside the church, friends, they see us as the Pharisee. They see us as the Pharisee in this parable, no matter how much we pretend or desire not to be. You see, we have our rituals and ways of functioning, and we really don't see others. We really don't hear others. We really don't know others unless they come and imitate our actions. That was put up on one of our sheets yesterday really seeing people, really listening to them, really knowing them. <clears throat> what we typically say to people is that we've always done it that way. Anybody ever hear those words? You go into an organization, you go to a church, even go to a job, and you want to do something different or you're uncomfortable and people tell you, no, this is how we've always That's what we say without understanding that identity is a two-way street, a dance, a give and take. We look at ourselves individually and corporately one way, and those outside our church friends, they see us in a totally different light. We think that we are welcoming, and we think that we are wonderful, and out there, they don't see that. They're questioning. I sat here while Dottie was singing, and a man came in, and he stood at the door, and I beckoned for him to come in, and he looked, and he shook his head, and he left. I was like, wow, God, really a sermon illustration? The text said, some who were confident in their own righteousness. Our righteousness comes into play when we begin to feel too good about what we do in God's name. Some may say, I come to church or I watch online every Sunday. I go to church every Sunday. Some will say, I serve faithfully. I show up for my post. My dad used to say that. If you got a post, show up for your post. Do your work on my assigned Sunday. You may say, I pray for others. I pledge annually. And I satisfy my pledge. Thus, I am confident in my own righteousness. And indeed, all of that is what God has called us to do. Yet the dance is for us to strike a balance between confidence and humility. Confidence and humility. 
For without any confidence and diligence and commitment, we would not be here today. And this church wouldn't have made it to celebrate 370 years of mission and ministry. Now the tax collector, on the other hand, is new to church and is not yet confident, but cognizant of his shortcomings. He's cognizant of his failures, his inadequacies, his fear, his shame, and his inability to understand what prayer is or even formulate one. Because remember, the story is about the tax collector and the Pharisee going up to the temple together to pray. And the Pharisee begins to pray, and I thank God I'm not like those other people. But the sinner looks down, he can't even look up because he's mindful of his inadequacy and his sin. The tax collector probably can't even believe that he is even in church, given all that conjures up for him from his life experiences and interactions with well-meaning church folk. When I saw that man at the door, I wondered, what is he thinking? Can I come in? Will they welcome me? I'm late. Will someone tell me I can't come in? I'll leave, maybe I'll try it another day. The tax collector can't even look up to heaven. And when he does, he wonders, am I even doing that correctly? Let's think about the other. We've become comfortable. But maybe the tax collector represents the one who has never been to church or their experience with church was not positive. The tax collector may say to himself, well, Pastor Tamara invited us to the altar. What is an altar? Which is why today I said, come to the altar, and I said, this represents the altar. I don't recall doing that before because I too assume that people know what it is. He probably said, can I go up there? Am I allowed? Will hellfire fall if I go up there? Some people don't know, should I kneel or should I stand? What in the world should I do? This is so serious, folks, as we are contemplating new life in Jesus Christ. Yet with all of those questions and wrestlings, Jesus says that he is justified. The one with all the questions and concerns, the one who feels that he's sinful. But what I recognize is that Jesus loves all of us, whether we're haughty or not. So it is his posture that Christ is justifying. It's his posture of humility that Christ is justifying. Earlier in chapter 18, Christ says to them, you must come to me like children. That's right, Ezekiel. You must come to me like children. We had someone talk to us yesterday who had resurrected a youth program at the church and she talked about us being available and mentioning children's names and making children welcome and saying yes to children. We must come like children. We must come on in. We must come wide-eyed, come with curiosity like a child. What's this? I wanted to, can I play with this? Come with questioning, come seeking confidently, but reverentially. People will come not focusing on self, but the one known as God, the great spirit, the I am, the alpha and the omega. Come with no boxes checked off. Come. No boxes checked off showing what we have done for God, but come listening. What am I hearing? 
Come seeking the one to whom we pray. Come wondering the wonder of a child. God wants us to come like a child wondering. Wondering whether we need any boxes to check off at all. To come showing up as that hymn that was written by Charlotte Elliott that says, just as I am. That's how we come, but that's how we want all of those out there that we're trying to reach to come. It said, just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. And that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come, just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blot. To thee whose blood can cleanse each spot, O Lamb of God, I come, I come, just as I am, Thy love unknown hath broken every barrier down now to be thine, yea, thine alone. O Lamb of God, I come, I come now to be thine, yea, thine alone. O Lamb of God, I come, I come. The power in that song at those crusades that Billy Graham held, they heard it and they came forward to make a decision for God. I think that's the humility God is looking for. Yet it takes confidence, godly confidence, to do what God calls us to do and to be who God calls us to be. And remembering that we are not alone we have each other because we need each other. And most importantly, we have Jesus Christ as our example of one who endured all. And in doing so, Christ, Christ was confident about himself. And his confidence propelled him to fulfill his ministry and even his appointment with death at Calvary's cross. He humbled himself and he said, not my will, but thy will be done. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. We thank you today, God. We thank you for the word. We thank you for that retreat that pricked us. We thank you for moving in us. We thank you, God, and we repent where we haven't been open to others. We haven't been open to change, where we have blocked those that tried to do something different. God, we repent in this place today for being the problem and not part of the solution for assuming what people's intentions were, and we don't know the intentions of a person's heart. We repent for speaking ill against others, because when we do that, we actually are cursing them. We repent, and we want all that you have for us, and we want to do better and be better. And we want to be a place where people feel free to come just as they are to learn of you. Let us never be a block or a hindrance to someone getting to Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Glory be to God.